Hi, welcome to Friesland Community Church. My name is Darren, I'm the lead pastor here and thanks for being with us today. This past week at our in-person service, we had the honor of having one of our own that grew up in this church and moved away, come back to give our message. It is amazing to me that so many people from this church have been called out to share the gospel in one way, shape, or form. And Rick is no exception. Rick DeYoung, he's a, a great guy from the Madison area, and we're just very, very fortunate and very blessed to have God work in and through this community to help people be able to share the gospel. It was a great message, and we pray that as you see it this week, that you are encouraged as well. One announcement as we get ready to start our service today is that next week we start a new series called 10, Set Free to Live Free. And I'm going to be sharing the message next week, and we are going to be talking about the Ten Commandments. Why do we have them? Well, are they even relevant for today? I mean, that was in the Old Testament. Does Jesus even talk about that? We're going to dig into the Ten Commandments and why we believe here that they're good and we should live by them as best as we can, knowing full that, well that whenever we fall, we have the grace from God through Jesus Christ to get back up and keep going again. Again, these rules that God gave the Israelites and us today are to set us free and to help us live an unentangled life from sin that so easily entangles us. All right, that's next week. But this week, we have Rick DeYoung sharing our message. So please, would you join me in a word of prayer as we begin our service? Father, we ask that you give us ears to hear and a heart to listen. Lord, we thank you for the faithfulness you've had to this place over the years to raise up many to be able to share the gospel in word and so many more indeed. God, we thank you for the people of this church, and we pray that you continue to work in and through each and every one of us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's Rick with this week's message. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's been a long time, and I recognize so many of you that uh, actually had me in Sunday school <laughs> and uh, taught me. Uh, so this morning, it was interesting. Uh, Brad DeYoung actually asked me to come speak, and I said, oh, this will be easy. I'll just use one of my past sermons, and, and uh, it was like, God impressed on me very well that that is not what I want you to do. And so he impressed on me that Psalm 100 is what uh, he wanted me to speak on, and it was like, really? I got to go back to the Old Testament, and, you know, I get get to come once, you know, I think it's been 35 years since I've actually been here. So, but he impressed on me that that's what we're to do. So, um, let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for this morning. We just pray that your word would have its way with us today. That you would be honored and your kingdom would be furthered. So, Lord, speak through your servant to that end. We pray. Amen. All right, so the title of our sermon this morning is Attitude of Gratitude. So I actually don't have a slide on this, but I want you to think about an attitude. You say, well, that guy really has an attitude. Okay? It's a, it's a presupposition as you enter something that you are going to presuppose or that is what you enter it with. And that this thinking kind of overrides uh, your attitude that you are going to present. All right. So, so you have to bear with me because I've got to figure out which way this goes here. So the objectives this morning, do I just slide it over or tap it? Just tap it. There we go. All right. So our objectives this morning... Are, is to, one, grow in the gratitude to God. One, examine why we may not be more thankful than we are. Four, to explore the basics of what God has done for us, which we sung about just a few minutes ago. And then four, to establish the foundations of an attitude of gratitude. All right, so Psalm 100. I believe it's in 557 
in your Bible. Bible through seven. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, it is he was God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth or faithfulness endureth to all generations. Now, that passage I probably quoted to one of you teachers here to get that memorized when I was probably 10 years old. And uh, so what we're going to look at this morning is predominantly verse 3. But first thing I wanted to speak about, I hope you don't mind if I speak off to the side. I'm not used to having a podium in front of me. Um, the uh, is anticipation. I want you each to think for just a minute, why are you here this morning? Come to your own thought. Why did you come? You know, I've been involved with church for a lot of years, and there's a lot of reasons that people come. It's just what we do, right? You know, we, we go to church on Sunday. Uh, we want to fellowship with other believers. We get some church business done. Some of us that were involved in maybe leadership, I got to talk to this person about that and this person about this. Some come to worship God. I like to hear, the, I like to sing. I like to sing. Uh, and that worship of God and then some to express our thankfulness to God. Well, that's what we're going to talk about this morning mostly because I want to ask you if, if you had an anticipation this morning as you come. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. So as you were coming this morning, did you have that anticipation of what God would do today. You know, the anticipation that of the, the love of God because he saved us. And that you were actually going to come with meet with God's people and the almighty God of the universe was going to meet with you. Was that awe around you as you came in, if you would, in your thinking? You know, he is actually willing to reveal himself to you as you come. In new ways, some of you have been coming here, I was thinking about having people raise hands. I bet you some of you have been coming here 60 to 70 years. But I tell you, the God that we serve is able to give you something new or to remind you of things you've forgotten every Sunday that you come and actually every day of your life as you seek him. And he wants to conform you to the image of his son. And uh, that is an awesome thing that God... Um, all right. He wants you to change your heart. You aware of that? That even as you come today, now your heart is your decision-making center. It's where things go on. He wants you to con continue to conform yourself Toward him. Now, toward him. For some of you that are involved in sports, you recognize that certain running backs in football, they always have a tendency to fall forward, right? And they get that extra yard or two as they fall forward because they're leaning forward. You know, we each of us have series of failures and setbacks in our lives. But I want to challenge you this morning to fall forward. Fall towards Christ. Move towards Christ. And even though some of you have been here for 60 years, week after week after week, 
The God we serve is big enough to continue to have us move toward him. So what's our responsibility in this? The final line up there. What would we do? It comes from Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God wants our whole heart. Not part of it. He wants us to seek after him. Day after day. Because we need him. We need him to reveal himself to us. And he is that big. So I want to ask you this question. Do Christians seek God? Do Christians really seek God? Here's some statistics. And these are quite current. Currently, only 32% of evangelical Christians read their Bible on a daily basis. Only 32%. For prayer, men not doing so good. Only 40% of men pray, evangelical men pray on a daily basis. That means 60% do not. Now women are a little better, about 60% of women pray on a daily basis. That means 40% don't. So if we're really seeking God, wouldn't we be driven to his word? driven to seek him in prayer. And then out of that would come, next one is thankfulness. I would argue, from my experience, is that Christians as a whole do not express thankfulness often that we should. So what's the answer? I would argue that we don't need to. We don't need to. Did you come today with the thinking that you were going to have your heart changed today? But we see, we don't need to. Why don't we need to? Because we have the other God that we serve. Well, Rick, what's that other God? Well, there's a second God that we have. And it's kind of made up of a two-headed serpent, if you would, because we end up worshiping competing gods. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and you will love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, actually, that money by the NIV there, um, and I'll, I quoted, by the way, early in King James because that's what I memorized it in. Um, I'll predominantly use the NIV. Is actually the God mammon. The God mammon. Or worldliness. All right. So this God of mammon, can I use you right now? So I asked Darren to come up as, a, as an example. This God mammon that we often don't see that we serve because, okay, so I'm going to play the God mammon as this guy right here serves the Lord. But see, the God of mammon comes along and says, hey, Darren, you know, I got a lot of things for you to do. You know, and, and all the time he's wooing us to his end, he is choking us. He is strangling us. He's strangling your faith, and you don't even know it. Thanks. So the God of Mammon, which I'm going to go right to the next slide here, is that it has two parts. It's us and him. And he is all too happy for have us to worship ourselves. Right? So that we actually are in a false worship. And you say, Rick, I, I don't do that. I don't do that. I declare to you right now, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. So is that the way you live daily? Do you live that way? Does your life reflect that? Is your thinking reflect that? As you go through your day, are you considering Christ 
as you come into that interaction, which I'm going to talk about in another way in just a minute. But you see, in, in America, we make ourselves, right? We're self-made people. We pulled ourselves up by our own bootstraps, right? Look at, look at all the stuff I have that, that, that God's blessing me, right? Because I have all this stuff. I'm going to talk about stuff a little bit more in just a second. But we think that we call the shots, right? I make this decision and that decision. How much of that do you really have control over? Really? Because I have stuff, I can rely on stuff. I can rely on my, what I have in my 401k for my retirement. I can rely on this and I can rely on that. And what happens is we don't rely on God. Because I'm going to tell you, all that can be taken away like that. You see, we actually live in two kingdoms. The world's kingdom, worldliness, the flesh, Bible, the scripture calls it, and God's kingdom. So, one of the most impactful books in my life is this book right here called Substance. It's written by Nick Gibson. He's actually the pastor of the church that we um, are involved in, in, in uh, heavily involved in in Madison on the west side. I can't develop, I don't have the time to develop all the thoughts, but this book goes into detail to expose your thinking, my thinking, in how the world has crept into almost every facet of our lives. And we are living in two kingdoms. And then it steps its way out. So I'd highly recommend this. I actually brought uh, several copies with me. So if you're interested in one, if this, if this touches you, if it doesn't, I'd still recommend it. Uh, it's called Substance. Uh, the subtitle of it is, is very good. It's Becoming o Oaks of Righteousness in a world of vapor, okay? okay? And we're going to talk about that passage from James in just a little bit. All right. So, the truth. The truth is laid out here in, in Psalm 100, verse 3. Know ye that the Lord, it is he who is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. What we need to do is identify the areas that that Ma'am and God is choking us and choking our faith, and we need to get rid of it. But that's not easy, because we're not even, we may not even recognize it, right? And I'll tell you, one of the telltale signs is a lack of thankfulness to God. All right, a couple of warnings. 1 John 2.15, do not love the world or anything in the world, for if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. One of my passages that I have kind of made important to me is this one, Colossians 2.8. See to it that no one takes you captive through empty and deceptive philosophy, which depend on human tradition and the, look at this, this part, the elemental spiritual forces of the world rather than on Christ. The spiritual side being involved in this. But I want you to see what's really important. See to it that no one takes you captive. It's the idea that this is captivating. It is deceptive. It makes, makes it look good. It's acceptable. Okay, I'm telling you before God, it's not. Okay. So, we've got to build a little hope in here now. That's God the builder. It is he who has made us. It is he who has made us. All right. So. Verse 3. What you believe is who you are. What you believe is who you are. 
Now, that's not what you think you believe. I want you to put actions with your belief. Do your actions and your attitude show what you believe? So, how much do you really control? How much do you really control? All right, this is uh, my store in Madison. I sell stuff. I sell cool stuff. I sell man stuff. I sell tractors. I sell attachments. I sell zero turns. I sell chainsaws. I sell lawn tractors. I sell all kinds of stuff. But I want you to think about this. I can have a pretty showroom like this and have all this stuff all lined up. I can advertise. I have billboards. I'm on the radio. I'm on TV. Some of you might see me on Channel 15. I'm on TV. But what makes that person come in the door? Can I make them come in my door? Can I make them, once they're in the door, purchase something for me? This is a, this is a real kind of whirlwind, okay? Because most of that stuff in that room, I don't own. Okay? The company owns it. They loan it to me. And if I don't get it sold, then I'm going to start owning it. Okay? So I need to get it sold. So I've got to, months in advance, guess. And believe me, what I do is I say, Lord, I need to know what, what you want me to do here. Right? But I can't make those people come to my door. I can't make them buy from me. I would argue vehemently that they, every one of the customers that walk in my door is a gift from God to me that he's moved in them some way to get them to come, and they're a blessing, okay? They're not a certainty. They're a blessing. All right. I would argue from the scriptures, James chapter 4, 13 through 17. By the way, I'm going to have different passages I'm not going to go to. But I'm going to give you an opportunity for it because Darren was gracious enough to print out the homework I have for you this week. So I have every day scheduled with, with some of the passages from this and a series of questions. So if you want that, it's on the back table back there. So thank you for doing that. Uh, so I'm not going to have a chance to develop this, but this is basically that you say you're going to go to this city or that city and do business in this, and he says, what's your life? It's but a what? It's a vapor. Okay. And being here today, it's to see you guys that allowed me to grow up in your presence. That's 50 years ago. That's 50 years ago. So, one of the things I've learned to hammer things home is good illustrations. Like, I want you to remember the God of Mammon is wooing you as he's choking you, okay? Second thing I want you to remember is this, the wall illustration. So the wall illustration, and I picked in particular a, a old uh, wall section of a barn, which most of you are very familiar with. And I want you to picture, and so I, I can't bring stones in here, so I brought a cardboard wall. But picture this being stones, okay, and mortar. This wall, you can see way outlasted the barn that's on the screen, is made of stones, hard stones from the field. Growing up, and I don't know if they do this anymore, we would call them hard heads. Okay? They're hard. They're strong. All right? So that wall is made up of those, and it's made up of mortar that holds them together. That wall, if it was just those field stones, one, you wouldn't be able to get it to stand up like that. You could pretty much, if you did, you could pretty much just push it right over. Right? There's nothing holding it together. On the other hand, if it was made of mortar which has no aggregate in it, it's only sand and Portland cement, basically. It's also extremely weak by itself. It needs the combination of them to be sound. All right, so I want you to think, why aren't some of those stones made out of sandstone? 
Why aren't some of those stones made out of limestone? Why? Because they won't stand the test of time. They'll disintegrate, right? And you're going to have a hole in your wall. So I want you to picture around you is a wall. That wall is made up of stones and mortar, just like that, except not real stones. The stones that are in here, the stones that are in here is your knowledge of God. It's your doctrine of God. What you believe to be true about him. The mortar that holds those stones together, that mortar is your relationship with God. If you have only theology, extremely weak. If you have only relationship and you don't study the deeper things of God, it's also weak. You need a combination of both to make that strong wall. But now I'm going to add to it John 10.10. What does John 10.10 say? Your enemy, your thief, wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Your enemy, Satan, is on the outside of this wall, and he's combing it day and night, night and day, without fail. He's looking for those sandstones, those limestones, or no stones, to reach in and do you great harm, to give you anxiety, to give you to lead you astray to follow the God of Mammon. Your job through time, no matter it be a year or 50 years, is to be out there examining that wall, and you can do it from the inside, examining that wall, adding stones like we're doing this morning, and hopefully growing in relationship, tuck pointing that wall, to make sure it is sound and good. That's what God the Builder has done and has provided for you. This protection. The problem is, if we are too involved with that God of mammon, then this is weak and subject to causing us great trouble, great harm. Our enemy, this is not a game to him. Look at those. He wants to kill you. He wants to steal everything he can from you. And he wants to destroy you. That's his goal. All right. I'm going to move this temporarily. I'll put it up later. All right. The God, the builder, wants us to build that sound wall. Verse, the second part of verse 3. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. That should be a great assurance because this whole idea is the fact that of the sheep pen that now protects the sheep. And we are his. But do we really seek him? Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. All right. We got to draw this down because I remember my dad complaining went, it went too long, right? So what do you believe? Really, what do you believe? Now what do you think you believe? We often see ourselves as something we're not, all right? That's James 1, through 25, looking into the mirror, and we forget what we look like. Never, ever... Under, underestimate the ability of you to deceive you. Think about what that, what that says. Never underestimate the ability of you to deceive you, to think that you are going in this way when you're really going in that way. Remember, empty and deceptive philosophy. Oh, I'm, I'm better than that, Rick. I know better than that. No, that, that's an arrogant attitude. Have the humble attitude. Seek out those around you that can give you advice. To say, what, what do you think about this? Am I doing this right? Is my thinking right? And, and guys, often that's our wives. Don't forget what, what they can. Sometimes we get really defensive when they tell us things. But remember, they're on your team. Okay. All right. Here we go. Okay. 
are you God or is God God? Are you God or is God God? First of all, I just want to spend just a minute with a non-believer. Some of you are, and I, I kind of try to use different terms. We call it non-believer. I want to call it this morning a non-follower of Christ. If you say that, Rick, I'm not a, really a disciple of Christ. I believe in God or, or any number of things. Well, I'm going to tell you then you're your own God because you've decided who's God. Right? But there's an empty tomb in Jerusalem you have to deal with. This guy, the guy of history that claimed to be the Messiah, that he was going to pay for the sins of the world on the cross before he did it. You know, the, what the prophets wrote about. Either Jesus was who he said he was, the savior of the world, or he's the greatest deceiver that ever walked the earth. You have to decide that. And if he is who he said he was, then I should seek him out with all my heart. What about you that say you follow Christ? I would argue that a, a presentation like this, or a sermon, does three predominant things. One, it adds to your knowledge and or relationship with God. Something maybe you haven't thought of before. But it adds to it. The second thing it does, for some of you, it's going to confirm, this is where I'm at. I, 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 I'm in that place. I'm in that place of anticipation of God working on a daily basis in my life and really renewing me, whether it, you know, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Um, Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you're in that state of constant renewal. I'm seeking God, going after him, pursuing him. All right. The last thing, and it would be number three up there, or a C, is convicted. Some of you here this morning may be convicted. That's, a, that's not what I'm living. That's not what I'm thinking. That's not what I'm doing. Okay. Well, then I challenge you, don't let today pass until you take steps to make the change. God wants to, to go after your heart. And he wants that to be in the part of the decision making of your, part, your heart. And you cannot do this online. You have to do this. Life is lived out in the Christian faith in a body of believers where you're rubbing up against one another. And you're close enough to them that someone can see what, what often is we're at arm's length today, especially after COVID. COVID is one of the, we were talking this morning of what, what a challenge it has been to the church. We want to get close enough to people that people can say, Rick, that is not good. I challenge you on that. But you see, if we stay now at arm's length, then we, don't, we can have, have people think of us as something we're really not. Okay. So, but you know, this passage is, is, is very uh, hopeful. For God is good. His mercy is everlasting. This is why, verse 1, why we can make a joyful noise unto the Lord and we can serve him with joy. And I would argue that the overall attitude of our life can be that of gratitude towards God. But remember, an attitude of gratitude can only come through an attitude of humility. They're mutually inclusive. You have to have one with the other. That we're willing to put ourselves at a place of risk to further our relationship with God. Do we have an attitude of gratitude because we've seen what God has done? Let's pray. So Father, we just want to thank you for the message that you have given us through Psalm 100 and the hope that it gives. Lord, I just pray that the challenge that would lay before us, that we would have grow in our knowledge of you, 
but not grow in our knowledge, as, as Scripture would say, so that we'd be puffed up, that we have all our doctrine straight. It is important for us to have that straight. But we must do it in the loving relationship with you and growing, and in that, the humility that would come and the attitude that we would, would over, override our lives. But Lord, I pray that today, lives would be changed, hearts would be changed, people would be moved toward you. Move in such a way. You are that big. We thank you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. Thanks again for being with us today. And we pray your time with us was blessed, encouraging, and challenging as well in your faith. Hear this benediction as we get ready to leave this space. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. We hope you have a great week. We'd love to see you soon in person. Bye.